introduction and to you, Mary, for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. So far, it has been a fantastic experience. I really enjoyed the class yesterday as well, so very honored. And now I'm going to start by making you work. Let's see. Okay, I need to stand this side. So what I would like you to do now is to think a little bit for a moment of the last time you really got angry at someone, but really, really, really angry. Give it a thought. Do you have that image on you? Okay, I can imagine that some of you, even if we are all here nicely speaking about empathy, you had this very little moment in which you would have liked to hit the other person. <laughs> Or considering the gender of this audience, maybe pulling the hair of the other, gen of the other person. <laughs> but hopefully, and I'm quite convinced of that, the majority of you didn't end up doing so. Maybe some did. Why didn't you do so? Probably you gave it a thought. Is this a good idea? Should I do it or not? Or maybe you remembered your mom when you were a child telling you violence is not the right way to solve your problems. But most likely, you just followed the golden rule. You just didn't like the idea of receiving back the pulling hair or the hit, right? And this golden rule is very old, right? It's very simple. But only about 20 years ago, research has found what is probably uh, is the neural basis for this rule. And this discovery came about in the lab of Giacomo Rizzolatti in Parma, which is even the city where I come from, so I feel very honored about that. And they were investigating the property of the motor system. So how do we move and how we interact with the environment, how we perceive objects and act upon them. So they were using uh, monkeys at that point, and what you see here in the middle is the image of a monkey brain, which you will see is very similar to the human one. And in blue, you see the areas that is considered to be part of the motor system, in, in particular, planning our actions. And what they found, or that was also very expected, is that neurons in this area, so single individual neurons, discharge when the monkey performs an action, like grasping a peanut or breaking a piece of paper. So this was nothing really uh, new, because that's what they thought this area was uh, doing at that point. But what was new and surprising is that the same neuron that was discharging when the monkey acted was also discharging when they, the monkey sees the experimenter doing the same action. Right, and see here you simply see in green, you see that you have a much more green when the gray bar uh, is in the middle of the graph. That means that the neuronal responses is stronger, both when the monkey performs and see somebody else performing an action. This for them was very, very um, impor an important discovery because for them it meant at that point that we basically stop seeing the actions of other people, but what we do, we start feeling them. And not only, because we basically activate the same regions that make us act. They also become active when we observe somebody else active. And these give us a very quick um, insight into what other people do. And not only in what the other people do, but also why they do it. And also, they allow you to predict what other people will do. So if, for, if, if for instance, you follow me now, I'm going to go down the stage. It will be difficult for you to understand why I do it. But now, if you see me reaching for a glass and the carafe, then you start understanding that I'm doing this, but probably because I'm thirsty. Okay? And basically, our brain uses the fact that we are similar. We, also, we are not just individuals, as we, we heard from this morning talk, but we also have a lot of similarities. And our brain uses the similarities to basically have an insight into what's going on in others. Of course, with some limitations, because I'm not you, uh, so we might also end up in making a mistake, right? I was not thirsty, I was just doing this action for an example, and that's why we need also other regions like theory of mind to compensate for this egocentric bias. But all this is a very nice story, but it started with one neuro in the monkey brain, right? And we are human. So I think that, that that research was really inspiring a lot of what came next. But first, I want to go back one second. Oh, no, I thought I had another slide in between. 
So the way we, uh, we decided to investigate uh, whether in humans we also activate the regions involved in our own action when you observe somebody else, was simply asking participants to come in the lab. They will be asked to perform actions in the fMRI scanner. And I guess most of you know what it is, but with the fMRI we can basically image the part of the brain that are active when you are doing some task. So here in red what you see are all the areas of the brain that become activated when you perform an action. And now what I can do, I can ask you to see somebody else performing an action when you are in the scanner. And so we would present our uh, participants videos such as this one where they just grasp a glass. And now we can map on the brain regions that are activated by when you see somebody else performing an action. And this is what you see here in blue. And the most important thing is to look for voxels in the brain, so areas of the brain that are activated both while the participants perform the actions and while the participant observes the action. And this is what you see here in white. It means that these two systems are very much overlapped. And, and from these studies, at the beginning, we concluded, OK, maybe the same type of mirror activity that we saw in the monkey is also present in humans. So we also activate our premotor regions when we observe somebody else, and we can get an insight about what they are doing. And continuing along this way of reasoning, we moved soon after from motor, like the motor domain, to the somatosensory domain. Because when we move, we don't just move. As, as you were presenting nicely this morning, we also know how much this weight, how much it feels, and the motor system and the somatosensory system are very much connected to each other. So if I now uh, go and I ask you to come into the scanner, and with this very high-tech tool, which is a hand glove brushing your leg, I can uh, basically map the brain activity that, that is activated in your brain when you attached yourself. And as it was nicely shown before me, the somatosensory cortices are activated, the primary and the secondary somatosensory cortex. And then I can again show you videos, for instance, of somebody else being touched. And by the way, these are Christian's legs, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, in blue, you see the areas that respond to Christian's legs being touched. And in white, you will see the overlap. So this is also true for touch. When we see somebody being touched, we activate the areas that make us feel that way. But if we go back to the original, the, the first example I gave you, and when we speak about empathy as well, what we mostly refer to are emotions, not just actions, not just sensations, but emotions. So what is happening when we witness somebody else's uh, facial expression or feeling in a certain way? So this time, we asked our participants to come in, and we gave them an anesthesia mask. And then they will wonder, okay, what is this about? <laughs> so what we did, we simply puffed in some odorants. And these odorants could be very pleasant, like mint, but they could also be quite unpleasant, like rotten eggs. And in this way, yes, that's, yeah, I was a participant at that point. I can guarantee you it's not pleasant. Um, so again, with, by doing this, we can identify what brain regions is activated by, the, by you feeling disgusted or having a nice experience of, um, of the mean smell. And then I can show you this video and ask you, would you like to drink from it? Probably not, right? And, uh, and by, by, uh, basically, by showing you somebody being disgusted, I can map what brain regions is uh, activated by seeing somebody else in disgust. And this is the blue blob that you see there. And again, we can look for an overlap between the two. So I don't want to be repetitive, but at the end, again, what we found is that even areas that are involved in, our, in making us feeling, for instance, in this case, disgusted, become activated by the sight of somebody else in disgust. So we do use our substrate to interpret what, or to perceive what goes on in others. And this region is called the anterior insula. And we also find anterior cingulate cortex. And they are also activated by simply reading something. Like, when I turn around to look who's leaning on your shoulder, you're peering into the unsightly face of a homeless guy. The guy leans forward and discharges the complete content of his inflamed stomach on you. 
you are covered with decaying vomit that was formed by rotten meat picked out of the garbage can across the street. So your insula, by reading these texts, will be very much active and sending you signs. That's why also reading books is so effective. And this region is also activated by when you're happy or when you see somebody else being happy. And this region is also activated by pain, when you are in pain and when you see somebody else being in pain or when you're sad and then you see somebody else in being sad. So basically, by the mere imagine anticipation of, what, of how the other would feel when you want to hit this person, you would be activating areas in the brain that would make you feel that way. You will uh, activate also the areas that you know, anticipate the action, the, how, how the sensation and the emotion associated for it. And this reactivation of, of regions that are involved in your own first-hand experience when you observe or anticipate what's going on in others is called a vicarious state or embodiment. Probably some of you are familiar with the word embodiment, like bringing the others into your own body or using your body to perceive other people. But <clears throat> as uh, somebody already mentioned this morning, we also need very, to be very careful when interpret uh, imaging results or in general results of experiment because what I've been showing so far are correlations. That means that if you're an alien and you come to herd and you are riding on the highway and then you want to understand what makes the car break and stop, you might wrongly assume that it's the red light on the back of the car because every time the car breaks, the light pops on. You, okay, so but this is not a causal relationship, this is just a correlation. So in order for us to really understand whether the regions that I showed you to be involved are actually involved, are really involved in creating a perception or, anti or an anticipation of what's going on of the other, I need to establish causality. Okay, so I invited again people in the scanner. I think most of my previous years are about inviting people to come into the scanner. And this time I simply asked them to judge, for instance, let's say, which one is heavier? I mean, you also have visual information in this case, so I'm cheating a little bit. But I guess you have no doubts, right, that this is the case. So this is a very easy task, unless I show you these videos. Uh, because now I normally ask, let's go back a little bit if I can, so you want you to, to see them both. Which one is the heaviest? First. Okay, so you see it's a bit less easy than what I showed you before for many reasons, but you will mostly likely to succeed, succeed in this task. And uh, if, you, if the areas I showed you before really participate in giving you a perception of what you observed, right? If I now go and play around with the activity of that area, I should be able to disrupt how good you are in this task. And the way in humans we play around with the activity in the brain is by using techniques like the transcranial magnetic uh, image, uh, technique. That, that means that you have a magnet, right? And it generates a magnetic field, and these magnetic fields, as a consequence, also generates an electrical field that interacts with how the, the, the neurons, uh, the, the state of the neurons, because neurons are active or not active, so basically it's a change in, a, in the electrical activity. So if I now go and, and change and perturb, starts to play around, I give you a bit of electrical activity, everything is either blocked or excited for a while, and it's a very short lasting. So basically, I now go and interact with this activity, and, let, and I'm going to check whether you're going to be better or worse at this task after I played around with it. And here what you see is that when you compare a fake stimulation, so I tell you, oh, maybe I'm stimulating, but I do nothing actually, with a situation in which I really uh, play around with the activity of the neurons, you see that when I play around with the activity, you become worse in the task. And the region I stimulated was one of the regions I showed you before to be involved in the perception of actions and in the perception of uh, sensations. So that really suggests that the, the activity of these regions is very crucial and important to get you the right perception and interpretation of what you observe. And then if I 
ask you whether this is specific for interpreting human actions or not, then the answer is yes, it is specific. And the reason why I know that is that because this time I generated movies of two balls falling on, the, on, a, on a surface, and I ask you again which one of the two is heavier. So you can perform this task equally well, but the somatosensory, a perturbation of the somatosensory cortex does not change your task performance. So the information that is elaborated in this region was specific to deducing the weight of an action when is an actor, a human being, lifting this, this, uh, this object. And if I now go and I perturb the activity of one of the other nodes of the circuits that was activated by uh, the observation of action, I see the same thing. So basically, every node of the, seems, of the system seems to be involved in our perception. We even had the opportunity to work with uh, patients that have a um, cerebellar disease that basically uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, interferes with the development and the functioning of some of the cell in, in, the, in, in the cerebellum. And when you do that and you ask these participants to lift two cans and to tell you which one is the heaviest of the two, you will see that basically they are worse than control. And you see that the blue if you take the line in the middle, it's lower compared to the line in the middle of the uh, brown shape, right? So they have a deficit in themselves, not being able to correctly judge the weight of objects. And now I can do again observation of action, so I show them uh, people lifting objects, and what I observe again is that the patient was were worse than the control, and, and again you need to look at the middle line of the blue compared to the middle line of the brown, they were worse than the control. So meaning that if you're worse during the, your, your experience, you become also worse in when you perceive the other. So your own experience already seems to be quite important. And the degree of the task performance correlated with the, how far they were in the disease. So it's a degenerative disease, so it gets worse with time. And so that was also a nice, a nice correlation. So again, here we are talking about circuits not areas. There was a question before, I think, about circuits and, and, and areas. So normally we just stimulate one specific area. We have the tendency to say this area is involved. But actually, whenever, because there, there are these connections in the brain, when we perturb one part of the brain, what we are doing, we are perturbing the whole brain, or at least everything that is connected to it. And here we, we run also a very <coughs> simple exp experiment. So we ask them again to observe the actions of others. And I did TMS on the somatosensory cortex while I was recording the activity in the other regions. And what I saw is that all these other regions that were connected functionally to the somatosensory cortex were changing their activity as a consequence as a per of a perturbation of the somatosensory cortex. So it's really a take home message that often we do speak about circuits and not just individual areas. So again, we started from actions and sensation, but we want to move forward into the domain of emotions. What can we say? How can we establish causality in the domain of emotions? This is very difficult, because the techniques that I showed you before, they only work for superficial areas. But the insula, the region that is involved in you feeling in a certain way and, uh, and uh, perceiving somebody else feeling in a certain way, is deep into the brain. So these techniques don't work. So what we did so far was relying on patients that suffered from stroke, for instance, so they had uh, damage in that region. So now I have a question for you. Which cake would you like to eat? This one or this one? <laughs> the first. And I was very glad that Mary yesterday served us a cake that looked more like the first. <laughs> <laughs> so the patients that had deficit or they had a, an insula that was not properly working, was damaged, they would be very indifferent to which slice of cake to take, right? They would in really be happy to take even the rotten slice of cake, and they would just eat it. They would not see the problem. So basically, if you have a damage in the anterior insula, you again, per you, you damage your, your, the, your way you perceive being disgusted yourself. And at the same time, you also damage the way these patients perceive other people's being disgusted. So this is the way in which we can establish a degree of causality between the activity of the insula during uh, at least some of the emotions and, uh, 
and the perception of emotion in others. So to sum up this part, Basically, when we observe other people, we reactivate brain regions that are active when we feel, when we sense, when we act, and when we, um, when we feel. And if we play around with the activity in these areas, what we do with this, basically, we're going to disrupt our perception. So, if you think about why do we need to perceive this, think about the case in which you hurt yourself. You feel pain. Why do you feel pain? Any idea? Why do you feel pain? Because you want to have, like it gives you the motivation to get rid of this pain, right? And not to incur into a danger anymore. It's really feeling pain is a motivation for you to act upon things, okay? I don't want to hit my hammer with a hammer anymore or I want to remove this uh, splinter I have in. So is it the case that the perception of other people's emotion can serve basically to, uh, to motivate us to go and help other people. So this is what I've, uh, I started to investigate over the past few years, and I, I will see the results together. Um, so here, again, people come into the scanner. This time, they're gonna be two people. And one person will be invited to be the pain receiver, so the, the person that will suffer throughout the experiment, and the other person will be the witness, okay? The person that will see the other person being in pain. And uh, basically, the pain is delivered with a mild electroshock. So honestly, I tried it, and it's more annoying than painful, um, of, for ethical reasons, right? We all agree that we cannot really induce much pain. Um, but it is quite um, pleasant, so it's not a positive uh, thing. So you will see, uh, as, a, as the one in the scanner, so the, the, the witness, you will see the facial expression of the other person receiving the, the electroshock. And then I'm gonna give you six euros, or a certain amount of money, and you can decide whether you want to give up some of this money in order to reduce the intensity of the next stimulation for the other person. So here you would see the first video, and based on what you perceive, you will decide, okay, how much money to donate. If you say, oh, it was not so painful after all, then what you will see, what will happen next, is that you will see another image of this person, again receiving the same intensity of stimulation. On the other hand, if you decide, oh, this was quite painful, I will give up a lot of money, then the next thing you will see is an image of this person that receives are almost non-painful stimulation that is proportionate to how much you donated. And what you find is basically a nice correlation between how much people donate and the intensity that was presented to them. And, uh, and now the ideal situation would be, let's go and interfere with the insula, which we know is involved, and see whether we can change this behavior. But as I told you before, this is not possible. So what we did, is that going back into the literature and understanding what other brain region that was more superficial could be involved in this process. So what we know is basically is the somatosensory cortex again, our nice friend uh, for touch, is also activated by the pain of other people as long as the pain, the source of the pain is visible. So if I present you videos like this one now, in which a belt is hitting the hand and the hand is, is moving in, in, in response, then the somatosensory will be involved. So now we can go and try to establish a causality between the activity of the somatosensory and your prosocial behavior. So in this case, we first recorded the activity and we saw basically what you see unlighted here in yellow is simply to mean that the activity in this region, contrarily to also what we thought at the beginning, was also correlated with the intensity of, um, of the uh, face video. So when the pain was um, shown just by changing your facial expression, so the, the correlation was high. And then also when, they, when we showed them the movies with the hand, it was again a nice correlation between the, the activity in these areas and the intensity presented in this video. So this was interesting, but then the most interesting part of the experiment was when we went with the TMS to stimulate the, the somatosensory cortex while they saw the first video, the one that, that you don't have control on, right, before you get the money. And when we do that, and we then plot the relationship between how much people donate and the intensity that they've seen, 
what we see is that this relationship is perturbed. People start donating more randomly. They are not so nicely associating how the, the amount of money to the intensity of the video. But this was only true for the case of the hand videos. So despite the activity of the, of the hand region of the somatosensory cortex in both, for both videos, when you play around with the activity of these areas, you only perturb how much you donate when you see the uh, sources of the pain. Again, suggested that for this region, something import, the, the, the most important signal is really a somatosensory signal. And then we wanted to understand whether the change in decision was due to the fact that what we were doing with the TMS was changing the way we perceive the stimulus to start with. So we modified the task a little bit, so participants simply had to report how much pain they saw and they perceived in that movie. So there was no donation. They just saw the movies and they had to tell me, okay, I think this was as painful as five or six. I mean, we had a scale. And when we again perturb that, the, the activity of the somatosensory, we see that the relationship between the rating, so what the participant reported, and what the, the, the pain receiver actually received in terms of intensity was perturbed. So that suggests that what is happening when we perturb the activity of the somatosensory is that, first of all, it disrupts your perception. And this percep perception is important, is an important part of the information that you will use to make your decision upon. Basically, this reactivation of your state when you observe somebody else in pain can really play a, an important role in attributing a value to what is happening to others. So if you are in pain, I have no idea about how you feel. I don't have access to that information because that's you, it's not me. So if I have to choose between donating money or giving up some of my time to help you, I need to be able to compare the value that I give to the money or my time to the value I give to your own pain. But how can I attribute a value to something that I'm not experiencing? I mean, there's years of research that tells us how we acquire value by experience, right? And here it's just observation. So, but by ac activating the regions that make me feel in pain when I see you in pain, now I have an easier way to attribute a value. Maybe it's a very biased value, but it still is a better that we can do. And, uh, and these values will enter the decision-making process, and now I can make my decision. Should I help or not? So I started my story speaking about monkey. And then I went all along showing a lot of things and implication for ourselves. So, but doesn't it make you think about uh, something, the fact that we found the neuron in the monkey to start with. Isn't it that maybe animals go through very similar kind of mechanism or experiences that we do because of this very simple um, neuronal activity? So if you want to investigate empathy in animals, you need to, to think about the terminology as well. Because when we speak about empathy, people would really argue that it is about you understanding that what you feel doesn't come from you, but it comes from the other, right? So there is this self-other discrimination that is associated with the meaning of the word empathy. And, uh, but, sorry, I'm gonna steal the, hopefully you're not gonna sue me, I'm gonna steal the image of your tree. <laughs> So if we now try to deconstruct the, the word empathy, we can basically nicely use the tree as an example in which the roots are probably not empathy in the way we are normally using it, but it's what we in, a, in, a, in neuroscience and psychology would call emotional contagion or mimicry. The fact that you become contagious by the emotions of other people even if you're not aware of it, the fact that the, these emotions come from the others. Okay, if we are in a nice place all together, we are gonna be all kind of feeling that atmosphere, or if, if it's a very sad event, we're also gonna be contagious by it. And, uh, and then we can speak of empathy proper, that's exactly what I was explaining to you before, in which the person can understand that the emotions don't come from himself. 
And then we can speak of sympathy as well as a component of empathy. And sympathy is simply feeling warm feelings towards the other, so it's another step forward. And then we can think of prosocial behavior in the tree of empathy, like which is the output of how we feel or in our decision making. And in Animo, we know that we cannot really measure empathy proper because we cannot ask them whether they were aware that emotion doesn't come from them or it comes from somebody else. We can also not easily investigate sympathy because again, we cannot ask them whether they feel warm feelings to the to what they are. We can observe behaviors, but we cannot be sure, right? We cannot ask. But what we can study are emotional contagions and something very close to what we would refer as a prosocial behavior. And here I want to show you what we use as a, um, a model of empathy in, uh, in rats. So normally you use two rats at a time and uh, you habituate to each other and to the environment. And then you have a testing phase. During this phase, similar to the previous experiment in human, one of the two rats will receive a mild electroshock. So the response of this uh, animal to the shock is a, a very natural response. Uh, and here you see this curve, and it shows that the animal at baseline before the shock doesn't freeze. So the, the, the basic response to, the, to any distress of the rodents is just freezing to try to figure out what is going on, especially because in the cage they cannot do something else, right? Um, and then when you give the, 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 the five mile shock, you will see that the amount of freezing increases to up to 80%, so it's very high. If we now would try to plot how much the observer, so the rat that just simply looks at the one receiving pain, uh, freezes, we would see nothing. We would not be able to plot. There is no freezing, nothing. But then if we simply add the, the following manipulation in which we expose the observer before the test to a mild electroshock, now during the, the test session, where the observer will simply witness, without experiencing anymore, simply witnessing somebody else in stress. And we would now plot the freezing both of the demonstrator in black and in orange, the one of the observer. We would see that the observer start freezing. And it freezes also only if you present the sound, they emit this quick beep. And then if you just present the sound, they will also uh, uh, freeze. And this is what we interpret as an example of the fact that they were contagious, they were understanding what goes on in, in the other uh, rat. And interestingly as well, if you now only take the perspective of the demonstrator and you plot how much they freeze dependently of whether they were paired with an observer that never exper experienced electroshock, so never froze, or whether they were paired with an observer that had the pre-experience of the electroshock and therefore also froze, then you can see that the demonstrator paired with the experienced observer, they were freezing more than the one that were paired with the one that didn't know what it was. Suggesting that there is a communication going on, that this contagion goes in both directions. So the demonstrator is also influenced by the response of the observer, which is very common in our everyday life, right? It's not one way street. We are interacting and we are perceiving both of us at the same time. And then you can run a lot of complicated uh, mathematical analysis in which you look at the time of the freezing of the demonstrator and the time of the freezing of the observer. And if you relate the two, the timing of the two, what you can conclude is that the behavior of the demonstrator is better described when you take into account, if I look at the future behavior of the demonstrator, this behavior is better described by a combination of the information coming from both the demonstrator and the observer. And the same is true for the observer. I can predict the observer behavior much better if I include in my uh, uh, analysis the information of both uh, rats. Again, supporting this idea that there is communication between the two. And similarly to what we do in Newman, we want to go and play around with the area and see that we know it's involved in uh, uh, emotional contagion and see whether indeed it changes the perception. And in, uh, in animal, you don't use normally TMS, but you can have an injection of uh, a drug that can temporarily uh, inhibit that region activity. And when you do that, what you observe is that if you now, in orange here on your 
let's say, depend on your right side, you see the normal behavior, so that was just water being injected there, so the observer will freeze uh, a lot when witnessing somebody, the, the other rat getting the shock, and now if I inhibit that region, and you see it on the graph in the, in, on the left side, you see that the rat freezes much less, suggesting that the anterior cingulate cortex, one of the regions that is involved in, in uh, processing the emotions of others, is indeed uh, crucial for the proper response of the animal to the distress of the other. Would the rat help? Wild guess. Lift your hand if you believe so. Ah, not so many hands for an empathic crowd. <laughs> okay, let, let's gonna have a look. So here you have two rats again, and the one with the two rhombi, square, like in front of it, these are two levers, and the, the rat can learn to press these two levers to obtain reward, which is normally food. So both levers deliver the same amount of food, two pellets of sugar, they really love them. But one is a bit harder to press than the other one, which is the darker gray. So with time, they will develop a preference, which is for the lighter gray, because it's easier to press, right? For the same amount of reward, who would go for the, for the other one? And now we can play a trick. We can basically associate to the easy lever a shock to the other rat. And then we can look whether the rat is willing to switch to the harder lever in order to avoid the shock to the other. And they do. So it doesn't go to zero, the, the complete switch, but you have about 25% of reduction and basically of switch from one level to the other. And if we look at what individuals do, we also see that not everyone is willing to help, only the yellow ones, suggesting that there is inter-individual differences between them, with some more willing to switch than others. And again, if I go and uh, perturb the region that I believe to be involved, what is happening is they don't switch anymore. So you see that the black squares that are the control, if you see the red line in the middle of the black squares, it goes down after the baseline, while if you look at the red one, there is no going down, which is what you would expect if they would switch. So do we always help? I think we already have part of the answer from the animal work. And we also know from our everyday life that we probably don't. We also know that we might not be all the same. So the amount of activity in our brain in response to the other might vary as well. And the situation can also matter. What if you're a boxer, for instance? Are these people simply lacking empathy? or they're simply good at regulating it, or it's simply a matter that they really value the money much more of the pain because they need the money. You know, there are many variables in there, so it's, I find it fascinating now to try to understand how this um, empathic activity can be modulated and how it varies between ourselves. And the first attempt, basically, to investigate this issue and in the inter-individual variability, variability was by administering you a questionnaire, very easy one. And uh, you, it goes like this, you need to read a sentence and then to attribute, to give a number to it uh, based on whether it represents you very well, and then it would be a number between three and four, for instance, or whether this sentence does not represent you well at all, like zero or one. So when I'm upset at someone, I usually try to put myself in his shoes for a while. <coughs> Who would say three? Ah, oh, okay, a few hands. And who would say one? And the others? Four? <laughs> okay, so now go on, you can read the next question. Like I sometimes try to understand my friends better by imagining how things look from their perspective, and so far, so forth. So I can have a global score of how much you uh, are empathic in a way, or you're able to take the perspective of other people. And once I do that, then I can place you in the scanner, present you with some sound, which can be, I don't know, opening a can or ripping a piece of paper, and I can map the activity um, of the brain when you perform this action and when you're listening to the sound of this action. And then I can try to split the group based on the empathic scores, 
And I can plot the brain how the brain activity looks like to the people that answered to me three or four, and it looks like this. And now I can map the activity of the people that answered to the questionnaire with a zero or one, and this would be their brain activity at the moment in which they were listening to the sound. Okay, suggesting that there is a correlation between the strength of this activity and how much your, uh, we can measure your ability to take the perspective of others. Showing again that, uh, you know, we, there is a certain degree of variability. It, it doesn't mean that you never activate the, uh, the area, but in these particular circumstances, it's not so strong. And this is also explained why when we go to the movie, some people would start crying and other people would just do something else. And then there are many other factors that participate in regulating our, uh, the activity of these regions. Fairness, for instance. If I make you play a game with other people, and uh, some of you, and, and some of the other people play fairly towards you, right? And then others will play less fairly with you. And then I give the electric shock to both of the other people, the one that played in a fair way, or the one that played in an unfair way. And I map your brain activity when you see the other people, when you know the other person is receiving the shock. You will see that the, activi the activity in the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex is reduced when you see that it's the unfair player that receives the shock. Quite simple. And this was true in a group of female participants. So you see a bit of reduction, but okay, not so strong. You still have a green, pink, sorry, a pink bar over there. And now we repeat the experiment in the group of male, and this is what you see. <laughs> this effect is even stronger, right? Whether this is a result of a cultural bias or whether there is something related to biological predisposition is still unknown, but there are differences between uh, many variables. And then again, in-group, out-group, you can manipulate it and nicely also uh, changes how much we activate this region. So it's enough for me to put you a t-shirt, like I, I split this room in two, you have a yellow t-shirt and you have a green t-shirt, right? And I make you play a game and then you win. Okay, if I now show you one teammate of yours receiving a shock or somebody from the other team, then you will have much stronger response to your teammate. I mean, it's just by playing a t-shirt on, on, on you. And this was done, was done with fan of uh, play, uh, basketball, I think, but it's the, the idea is the same. And even race matters. I mean, here it was not brain activity measured with fMRI, it was measured in, in other means that it's not so, I mean, I, I could explain, but I don't think that's the, the core problem. But what they saw, uh, again, is that you are more sensitive to people from your own race compared to people of other race. Right? And this uh, explains you also why sometimes there are some behaviors that go on that we would rationally think it's not the way we should solve our problem. And um, even being responsible for causing the pain of others plays a role. So, for instance, if, we are, if we're playing a game together, just me and you, <laughs> we need to respond as fast as possible to the middle letter here. Right? And then I press L, and you also press L, so we are both correct, then Mary, for instance, who is the pain receiver, will not get any shock because we are both correct. But then if I press H by mistake or because I didn't see it, and then you press L, then there is a mistake and Mary will receive the shock. So by manipulating who is making the mistake, I can vary basically uh, the, the level of responsibility of our participant. So if you're both correct, there is no pain, but whoever makes a mistake, there is pain. But if we, if we are both incorrect, we are both responsible. If I'm the only one make a mistake, I'm the only responsible. And if she is the one making the mistake, oh, I'm out of it, okay? And what we saw is being responsible of causing the pain of others increases the activity in the insula. But sharing the responsibility, it reduces the activity at the same level of not being responsible, which is uh, not necessarily an intuitive uh, thought, although a lot of psychology experiments uh, support uh, extensively this point. And now let's go even more extreme. What if you're a psychopath? Psychopaths, as you probably know better than me, are persons that have been considered 
for years to lack empathy. So when we approached the experiment and we thought about this experiment at first and we approached the clinic, we had this intuition that we would observe less activity in all these regions because of the common knowledge, oh, they lack empathy, right? So we approached incarcerated psychopathy, so they did commit a crime, and they man we managed to have them coming in the lab and in the scanner. And then we wonder how they would react to the observation of other people's emotional actions. So we presented them with movies of painful interactions, like this, twisting a finger, or by excluding the other person, goes away, um, or what we call neutral interaction. I mean, I'm, I'm not a strong believer of a neutral state, honestly, but that's probably the easy way to describe it. And, uh, and then we present it with a pleasant stimulus, like a caress. And then what we did, we, we made them experience the same uh, emotions and same actions. We hit them in the scanner with a ruler, brandly so. Um, we excluded them, so they had the instructions to look for the experimenter, and every time they would do that, we would just push them away. And it was in interesting to see how easy it is to generate a, a sense of exclusion, even in an artificial setting like a scanner. They, everyone, even the control group, really report, oh, I really felt excluded. And then uh, we shake hands with them, or we caress them. And then we were looking for brain activity activated by both the experience and the observation. And one of the first hypotheses was try to see whether they would already be deficitarian or just abnormal uh, when they receive the pain, for instance, because some people also argue oh, they're a bit stronger, they don't care about pain. But when we looked at the activity during the experience part alone, there were no differences between the control group and the incarcerated people. So then we can freely do the, the, the other comparison to see how they uh, perceive the actions of others. So when we plot the overlap between experiencing and observing into the control group, we see the usual uh, candidates. So we see all the areas that are involved in action perception, in sensation, and in emotion, because this, the stimuli included all these three domains. And when we plotted the activity in the psychopath, we saw these areas being really, really reduced in activity. So that was originally uh, confirming our hypothesis and say, okay, they have reduced uh, uh, empathy, but they also have reduced activity in the areas that would allow empathy to be there to start with. But then we also heard all these stories, right? Oh, but he was such a nice neighbor. I would never have thought that he committed such a bad action. And when I met them in the scanner, honestly, I started to doubt about my ability to perceive others, which I normally tend to be quite accurate. But he was such a nice guy. I would hang up with this guy very easily. So that was really puzzling because if they do, don't, if they don't have this activity, how can they kind of show to be such an empathic individual to, to fool you? So we, we decided to manipulate this task in a more active way. So this time we asked them to actively put themselves into the shoes of the receiving hand. So the, the hand that was either receiving the caress or to receiving the pain, okay? So the, the real task was really follow the instruction, try to put yourself in there. And when we do that, and we, when we do that, and we now map the activity in their brain, what you see is that the difference that we observed before was not there any, anymore. Once you ask them to put themselves into the other shoes, the activity was as much as those of those controls. And what, is, does, what does it suggest? It suggests that they don't really lack the ability to do it, but they do lack the this, this spontaneity in doing so. So they would not uh, activate this system straight away, but if they need, or if they have to, then they can. So maybe it's their, they, they, they can regulate the system much better than, uh, than we can do. And this brought us to, indeed, um, uh, also um, basically 
uh, build up tasks and situations which you can really dissociate ability from propensity and to really dissociate whether an activity reflects a more uh, deliberate uh, kind of uh, action or a more spontaneous one. So when you present these stimuli and you ask a person to really empathize with the stimuli, then what you're doing, you are really trying to, you're measuring how far they can go. They're measuring your ability because they, they will follow the task. When you ask them to simply just watch a movie without any explicit task, what you're doing, you're basically measuring how spontaneously they do so. And when you ask them, for instance, is this a man or a woman? So you distract them from what you're really interested in. What you're measuring, if you still find activity in there, what you're measuring is the automatic process, the fact they cannot avoid and, um, uh, activating these regions. And uh, this brought us also to expand a little bit how we uh, speak and treat about empathy, because if we would now only map empathy into our uh, ability to do so, like what most of the um, therapy also or, or programs uh, kind of work on, you would basically place the, uh, the empathic individuals in very high and the psychopath very low. So high is uh, towards the direction of the arrow and, and the low is towards the left side. But if we now also include a second dimension, which is the empathic propensity, how much would you do that spontaneously? Then you see that the empathic individual, we probably score high in both, and then you would place them there in the corner, but the psychopath would now go along the empathic ability line so they have high ability to do so, but what they lack is the, the, the propensity. It's the opposite. So they, if, if they are not asked to, right, then they don't, they don't show any activity, so they don't seem to do it spontaneously. Right? But when you ask them to be empathic, they show that they can be. It doesn't mean that they, <laughs> they, they will do, but they can be. Yeah, which is already something that is, I mean, when you speak with psychiatrists, I, I'm working now with many psychiatrists, they would really argue, no, I believe that they are empathic, but just towards a very limited number of people or whether the, the circumstances are such that it matters to them, right? But the, the common, at that point, the common thought was that they were not at all. And now it gives you a little bit more freedom in uh, trying to understand the phenomena and trying to also come up with way and therapies to approach the problem because now if you distinguish, because the, 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 the ability from the propensity, you can really tackle two different aspects. The one is more towards the regulation uh, and, and the other one is more something you can or you cannot do or that what part you need to train. And, and there were some, uh, some thoughts, right, that if you only train the ability without giving, working on the motivational aspect, you know, you might create even stronger psychopath, right, because they may, you make them even more able to manipulate you. So what you need to really think about is, okay, how can I make it this a habit, right? Or, or making it more spontaneous. And this uh, regulatory aspect of empathy is not just a property associated with psychopathy. It's something we all have. So if I now ask you to watch a very nice movie in the scanner while putting yourself into the uh, character feelings, you will have stronger activity and reaction to this movie compared to a situation in which I ask you, oh, please, try to be a scientist and analyze the movie very accurately. So your report of how the character feels will be exactly the same, so you will be accurate under both tasks, so you will be able to report how much the actor feels either way, whether you put yourself in, in the other shoes or whether you simply analyze the movie, but the brain activity will be different. When you will put yourself into the other shoes, you will have all this system lighting up much more than if you only just report how much the other feels. So I would like now to conclude by, again, giving you this idea that when we are with people, we use ourselves to have a first intuitive um, perception and understanding of what the other does, what the other sense, and what the other feels. And uh, this vicarious state is definitely interfering or giving, like helping us to perceive what the other does, 
And it, probably, and it does also participate in our decision making, like either motivating or at least helping to make a decision whether we want or not uh, help the other person. And all this is not a black and white picture. All this is susceptible to the environment you're in, to your past experience, to who you are, your genetic background. It's a very fluid, dynamic, plastic, plastic uh, um, system. So that's, it's, that is also why it's not so easy to come up with a final solution, right? And it would also not be good to say, oh, we should all be super empathic, because that might not be effective after all, right? At, at one point, if we are a doctor, we want to save, you know, we are in war, and, and we need, one comes with a broken leg, we want to help this person. If we would just let all the emotions flow in, we would not be able to act. So we need to control and being able to control it. So now I would like to thank you all for your attention despite being after lunch. I hope I was able to entertain you. I don't have such a nice sense of humor as the previous speakers, but I hope you forgive me. <laughs> I'm not British. <laughs> and I would also like to take one minute to thank the famous husband, <laughs> Christian Kiesers, with whom, with whom I indeed started a full career and a full adventure, private and not private, and we're still there together, happy to be together. Um, I would like to thank Giacomo Rizzolatti and Vittorio Vagallese, who were the people that discovered the mirror neurons I spoke about at the very beginning, and it was a very turning point, I think, in neuroscience. I would like to thank Nicola, Alessio, and Sara for all the help in the TMS. They really introduced me and did a lot of the experiment in the TMS. Uh, Judith and Abdel for all the work with the uh, action and the cerebellar uh, patients. Sway, uh, that she did the work on responsibility. Harma, that did all the work on uh, psychopathy. There was a lot of work. Uh, all the people of the lab now that are working in trying to understand how we can regulate empathy and how do we learn actually to become empathic because I'm a strong believer that we can train. Um, all the people that did the animal work, and if you want to read more, given that uh, we can advertise ourselves, you can read Christian's book. And finally, in the era of the hidden figures, I have to thank two more people. And this is because sometimes in science what you do, you're very enthusiastic, you start an experiment, and this experiment that should be done in six months actually is not done before four years. And then you're so happy, finally you have the results, you try to publish, and they got rejected two, three times. Another year later, you're still hoping to, to publish. So you need more than just curiosity to keep your motivation high. And I have to say that these two people played a big role in helping me to go through it. And I guess you know who they are. <laughs> Thank you.